welcome to our chef and industry briefing for the James Beer Foundation Climate Solutions for Restaurant Survival Campaign. I am Anne McBride, I'm the Vice President of Programs at the Foundation, um, and it's my real pleasure to, um, to welcome you to this moment and to also introduce the people you'll be hearing from today uh, who will speak right after me. So Dr. Tara Scully, the Curriculum Director at the Global Food Institute at the George Washington University. Dr. Bill Dietz, Director of the Sumner M. Redstone Global Center for Prevention and Wellness and the Global Food Institute's Director of Research and Policy. And both Tara and Bill uh, worked on the reports that you may have seen on our website. Patricia Griffin, partner at NVG, our legislative and policy expert. Mike Amato, our campaign communications director. And Karen Gasper, our campaign director. There will be a Q&A at the end of the, uh, after we've, we're all done talking, we'll leave plenty of time for your questions, your comments, um, anything around how, we will tell you a lot about how to get involved, but anything you have beyond that that you want to uh, share with people that you want to ask. Um, so we are here today to talk about the threats that climate change poses to independent restaurants and the producers who supply them, which is why we launched the campaign, the Climate Solutions for Restaurant Survival campaign. The key point here is very much this, this economic argument, the fact that the independent restaurant industry, the restaurant industry as a whole is under such threat from extreme weather events, whether it's too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, et cetera. There are so many ways in which these climate events that are happening no longer once every hundred years, but once every year, once every couple of months, depending on um, these things that last for a very long time, that impact the food you're receiving, the price you're paying for your food, the people who are showing up or not in your restaurant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a real problem for the industry. Um, and so we've decided to launch this advocacy campaign um, and really get all of the, the strength of the chef community together to make some real changes and have some real legislative impact. Uh, today, uh, chefs from 41 states signed us up, signed up to be part of just this campaign briefing. So clearly this is something that resonates and that uh, all of you around every part of the country can identify and be sure that we will track the nine states who don't have people registered and get them engaged in some other fashion. And we've been very overwhelmed with the great online engagement to date on, through our social platforms, all the messages that we've received uh, since we did a launch event last week in partnership with the Global Food Institute and Chef Jose Andres, which elevated the chef and producer's experience with climate change. You can find a recording of that on our website. The way that we will break through, though, and make a real difference in the places that matter most, your communities, is through your engagement, which is why we're here today. Um, we heard last week on our um, press launch uh, from Chef JJ Johnson in New York, who has a rice-based concept, so who's very impacted by uh, changes that impact the production of rice, the production of seafood, um, including some vegetable, as well as some vegetables he doesn't have access to. And we heard from farmer Emma Jagots from um, Virginia, who's deeply impacted uh, by, um, whose crops are deeply impacted and what she's able to supply to restaurants in the DC area. Uh, it, it has changed, has becoming more expensive for them and for her, et cetera, et cetera. So um, these are the kind of things that we want to hear from all of you because what we, the more direct experience we can share with the media who are asking us questions about the campaign, with lawmakers, when we're preparing op-eds to engage you in, uh, when we're talking to people, to reporters who might want to interview someone in your communities, the more concrete examples we have to share, uh, the better we can, uh, the, the, the more concrete the, and, and data-driven, if you want, the campaign becomes, um, and the more we get this mix of your lived experience um, with some real numbers. And for all of you who have talked with your lawmakers in the past, you know how important that is. They wanna hear from you, they wanna hear your experience. So that's what we're here to do. And that's what a survey that Emily is dropping in the chat now, and we'll talk about that later again, um, will help us do. Um, it asks you to share some of this concrete information and then um, 
it will also give you an opportunity to give us a little bit more details for further engagements. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. So um, before we talk more in depth about the survey, I will pass it to Dr. Bill Dietz, the Global Food Institute's Director of Research and Policy, who can tell you a little bit more about the content of the report. And I should have said that this campaign is informed by research. Um, it is informed by a research um, conducted by the Global Food Institute by Bill, Dr. Scully and Dr. Dietz. Um, you can find it on our website to read the uh, 60 plus pages of the report. They're going to give you some highlights of it today and tell you a little bit more about the work of GFI as well. Um, and then on the website, we'll also have a, uh, a take action summary of the report. But, um, without further ado, let me pass it on to Dr. Dietz, who will tell you more about the report and the research. Take it away, Bill. Great. Thanks, Anne. Um, and good afternoon. It is a real pleasure and honor to be here um, with the, the James Beard Foundation. Um, I wanted to begin with a summary of, of why GFI uh, is interested in this and, and a little bit more about the history of GFI. Um, the Global Food Institute reflects a decade-long affiliation of Jose Andres with George Washington University, and uh, whose mission is, and this has become the mission of GFI, is to change the world through the power of food. Um, Jose has had a 10-year affiliation with GW, including teaching the world on a plate with an emphasis on undergraduate education, which he's done for the last six years with Dr. Scully. And he uh, endowed the Global Food Institute to focus on humanities, by which he means uh, food and uh, religion or food and women's issues, uh, food policy and food innovation, with the major task of building the next generation of leaders in the area of food. Um, GFI received grant support from the Rockefeller uh, Foundation, which has allowed us to build capacity through new undergraduate courses on food like food policy and convenings that prompt action, like one we're planning and convening in uh, mid-March on food service guidelines for federal facilities in collaboration with the Federal Good Food Purchasing Coalition. A major focus of GFI is research and their interrelationships in food and climate change are a major area of interest. Within food systems, there's no problem of a greater urgency or greater concern. Climate change poses an existential risk to both human and planetary health. And the relationship of food to climate change is bi-directional. For example, cattle generate methane and the, and the production of their fodder generates nitrous oxide. Both of these are very potent greenhouse gases. The net result is a rise in global temperature and increased what we call unnatural disasters, uh, which are no longer natural. They're now driven by climate change and affect every component uh, and level of the food supply chain. We've been thrilled to collaborate with the foundation to examine the impact of climate change and its effect on the food supply chain, from the availability and quality of specific foods and condiments to the effects on your patrons and costs. Dr. Scully led the report entitled The Climate Reality for Independent Restaurants, and will now share with you some of the specifics of what we've learned. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be here today to share with you the results of our report and talk about the action which you can take. At the Global Food Institute, we wanted to really illustrate the importance of small businesses in our food system, both at a national level, but also making it relevant to all of us at a community level. This type of research is important to tie together all of your stories in order to amplify the challenges that you are facing. You may not be facing the exact same type of experience, but related to climate change, but these experiences are united in that they're connected to regional and national climate events. Because independent restaurants lack the leveraging scale of chain restaurants, they remain vulnerable to even one climate related event. So why should we care? We think it's not just that your restaurants are the cornerstones to our communities where we share our birthdays, our anniversaries, and other celebrations, but it really is the impact on the economy that cannot be denied. You make up the fifth largest industry in our country, paying almost $75 billion in wages with an incredibly diverse workforce and ownership. The challenges of starting an independent restaurant are well known. But climate events are heightening these challenges in an industry which has extremely tight profit margins and where purchases account for over 40 percent of your costs. The supply chain remains a heavy burden for independent restaurants. 
Most evident is climate impacts on food production. Farmers are directly impacted as their crop yields could be reduced. And these reductions have a trickle down effect on the suppliers and also you as independent restaurants. Reduced crop yields may also affect supply chains and disrupting it, which can also impact your restaurants as well by increasing the prices, delaying deliveries, and also potentially just making a certain product unavailable. Low agricultural yields and current inflation are increasing the prices of food, as we well know. At 8%, 2012, sorry, not 2012, 2021 and 2022 saw the largest increase in restaurant food pricing in the past 40 years. It's so substantial. Furthermore, the USDA reports that all foods were expected to increase by 5.8% in 2023 alone. The agricultural industry is a critical sector of the U.S. economy, contributing to $1.1 trillion in the U.S. GDP. It accounts for 10.9% of total em um, employment and employing over 22 million people, with 13 million of them in the food service industry. Overall, U.S. food industries has been growing over time. In 2011 to 2021, the U.S. food industry value increased from $875 billion to $1.25 trillion. Some prime examples of variable disruptions due to climate change are droughts in Texas, hurricanes in, in Florida, wildfires in California, and also temperature changes affecting seafood catches. The three states that I just mentioned are extremely important when we consider the independent restaurant industry because they make up 30% of the independent restaurants in the United States. They have nearly 1 million employees paying out $20 billion in wages and generating almost $65 billion in revenue. So let's look at each of these. Texas was challenged by droughts in 2011 and 12, as well as in the past two years. These record-breaking temperatures aren't just causing crop loss, but also affecting whether or not people even go outside. In areas like San Antonio, we heard from restaurateurs where their restaurants are designed for outdoor eating. And people don't want to go outside and sit and sweat while they're eating. But also they had this, the opposite issue during the winter. Texas has experienced severe cold conditions during their, their winters in the past few years. And it's like you can't win in any season now in Texas. Hurricanes, of course, are notoriously damaging, whether it's wind or rain or both. Uh, for one hurricane in Florida last year, wind damage alone was estimated to be at $4 billion. Florida's crops are clearly getting affected, but also aquaculture as well, which helps to supply your restaurants with certain foods. The fishing industry gets put on hold when a hurricane comes about. Restaurants have to not only shut down due to hurricanes, but when they reopen, they aren't getting their regular catch for quite some time because of long lasting effects from these hurricanes. In California, of the top 20 largest wildfires ever recorded since 1932, 18 out of the 20 have occurred in the past 20 years. Nine of those in the past three years alone. In 2023, year to date, there, there were over 300,000 acres affected by more than 7,000 wildfires. Most astonishing, in, 2000, in 2020, over 4 million acres were affected. Not only does this destroy crops that you may be trying to source, but it also can result in smoke tank. This is especially impactful on grape production. Either the winemaker has to choose whether they're going to make wine with smoke tank or skip a year, which can have a huge financial burden. On top of that, the impact on restaurant attendance. Who wants to go outside when they can't see a few feet in front of them? And this is not just a problem out on the West Coast. The East Coast also experienced this with the record-breaking wildfires in Canada this year or this past year. Um, then there are the warming waters resulting in changes to seafood habitat range. From lobsters to sea bass, these species have very specific temperature requirements. And this is not only affecting the fishing industry, but also access to certain fish for you as independent restaurants. And unfortunately, the U.S. is not alone. We give many examples in the report of issues around the globe. Um, in 2020, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction Report, um, they saw that 4,200 reported natural disasters were recorded in the 80s and 90s. 
This increased in the next two de decades to 7,300. This had a doubling effect on human deaths from 500,000 to 1.2 million in the second two decades. And although this increase should seem shocking, what is more disturbing are the trends that of these disasters in the last 42 months. So from 2020 to 2023, the global average annual record of storms has increased by 19%, floods have increased by 23%, and wildfires by 29%. This, of course, has an effect on food production, but also transportation challenges and even customer behavior, like I said. So let's now talk about what we can do. I'm going to hand it over to Tricia to talk to you about the next steps. Thank you, Tara. Hi, folks. Uh, I see some old friends and some new friends. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of play of the Farm Bill. Um, while our work will expand and, and, and be alive beyond the context of the Farm Bill, the Farm Bill is a really important tool for us um, to push some very important agendas as it relates to uh, climate change and its relationship to the industry. So the Farm Bill, as many of you know and heard from me over the years, is one of the largest or the largest piece of federal policy that pertains to food, farming, land, forest, conservation, and so much more. It's reauthorized every five years with some exceptions like we're experiencing right now. Um, the, latest, the latest Farm Bill expired last year and we have yet to finalize that bill. The partisanship issues within the House and the Senate, as well as between the two chambers, have made it difficult to move a bill uh, to a place where the, the entire Congress can consider it. Additionally, as you are I'm sure well aware, um, we are presently in election year, and that makes it difficult to move any kind of big pieces of legislation. With that said, we are still hopeful, and we are still going to keep pressure on legislators to get this bill done. So let's talk a little bit about the policies we support in the context of the Farm Bill and, and, and beyond. The campaign will support policies and programs that are focused on fighting climate change through the food system, as well as exploring other areas of the federal government that could support the industry challenges brought on by climate change. They will include policies and programs that focus on how our food is produced, by whom, what is produced, and how often. We want to look across all the areas of the federal government and determine what programs exist in other, in other agencies um, or that could be developed to alleviate the economic stress on the independent restaurant industry. There is no silver bullet as it relates to climate change, as you well know, but agriculture and farming can account for a great, account for a great portion of carbon emissions in the United States and the world. That is why we believe USDA has a responsibility to use the Farm Bill and its other resources to move the needle. So some of the key policy areas we're supporting right now in the context of the Farm Bill are as follows. Conservation programs. These are programs that support farmers in implementing farm practices that help mitigate climate change, increase yields, and source sustainable ingredients for restaurants. Some of the existing USDA conservation programs are historically have historically been underfunded and overprescribed. There was a bill last year called the Infl Inflation Reduction Act (IRA) that was able to increase the resources for these programs at the highest levels ever. These programs incentivize farmers to engage in cover crops, rotational grazing, and organic farming, even while working their land for production. They provide TA to implement conservation practice and support innovation, new ideas to protect the soil, the water, and land. We are working with our allies to make sure that this increase in resources will not be stripped from the Farm Bill. We must support greater opportunities for all farmers to use these programs in order to see and, and demonstrate greater impact. We also want to advance and grow climate smart programs. These are a newer class of programs that have overlap and are very much in partnership with conservation. These programs address the volatile aspects of farming, implement ecological strategies to make land more resilient. Resources for research and programs for more advanced climate smart practices must be a priority for USDA. It's vital that these practices with the conservation practices are applied at a larger scale and at the same time that we continue to monitor and close the knowledge gap on the effectiveness of these new innovations. And finally, we will support the programs and resources that support the local and sustainable farming practices that are run through USDA. These programs diversify our supply chain. They provide opportunities for success of small, mid-sized, and disenfranchised farmers. 
While USDA has made some great strides in diversifying some other parts of the food system, farming models continue to move in the wrong direction. As Secretary Vilsack said at a congressional hearing last week, I think it's important for us to reset the notion that the only option in American agriculture is to get big or get out. It's time for us to do better for our small and mid-sized farming operations. Those 93% that share 15% of the income that are surviving for the most part by taking a second job. Now, what I just laid out is a very high level over overview of the policy focus for now. We will be building and expanding as we learn more about the challenges that you are be facing and your, your partners are facing and explore innovative ways of combating those challenges. As you probably know, the best ideas don't get created here in DC, um, but pull from the learnings and from those that are most impacted. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Tricia. Okay, sorry, I'm getting, I did unmute myself. I did not need Zoom assistance on this. <laughs> um, what is the, the most, what are the most impactful actions that constituents can undertake to have a consequential impact on how their elected officials engage or vote on these issues? Well, first and foremost, I mean, again, if you've if you've run into me uh, in a boot camp, <laughs> you will know that um, the number one way for this to look different in Washington D.C. if those that are most impacted by it, that are running businesses and, and employing folks in communities, use their voice, use their voice to tell the story. Um, with support from folks like us and others that are helping to advocate for this change, talk about your experience, talk about your concern. Um, I think people make assumptions that if you sit in one part of the private sector or industry that you may not care about these other um, issues. And making this connection between the economics of the independent restaurant community and climate change has not been done before. Yes, the economics of other industries and climate change have been done, but this is a big deal. And you can play a central role in how information is delivered and how it's received. And that could really change the game in Washington, DC. Um, I also encourage you in using your voice, meet and build relationships with your members of Congress, their staff. It seems like a big undertaking. Again, with the support of the James Beard Foundation and other um, allies and partners, these folks work for you. I know I tell you this every time I see you. They, need, they, are, they are accountable to you and your needs, and you play a very powerful role in that community and making them hear now, in addition to other challenges and other issues you care about, that climate change is another category that they need to pay attention to. Um, and then I think it's about building a broader community. Share what you're doing, demonstrate it, share it on social media, um, let us help you organize with other chefs and those that are, are finding this engagement with members interesting or they're learning something about that experience. So those are my couple of cents on that piece. Great. Thank you so much, Trisha. And for those of you who are in the D.C. area next week, um, I'm putting in the chat a link. We're doing a policy salon with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, if you are in the D.C. area, most likely you've heard about it from us already. But if not, here's the link. It's on Tuesday uh, with Shelley Pingree, Representative Shelley Pingree from 8 to 10 in the morning. So feel free to RSVP to that. Um, and Trisha, thank you for mentioning social media because it makes the segue to Mike Amato, our campaign's communications director, um, even smoother since uh, he will take you through some of the resources we already have available on our website. Hi, thanks, Anne. Good to see you all. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about how we can work together on this endeavor. Um, Having spent many years working for members of Congress, I know that the only way they're gonna listen and take action is if they hear directly from you. Uh, you have unique and powerful voices in your communities, your business owners, job creators, cultural and economic engines in your communities and the districts that they represent, and they are accountable to you and they need to hear from you. Uh, we can have all the data, the facts, and nothing against the great report that, uh, Global Food Institute put together, we can have all that information, but what really brings it to life is your stories, your voice, and your experience is what makes this matter and resonate with members of Congress. So 
they need to hear from you and we want to work with you to make sure that they do and that and that that message is clear um so to help you make your voices heard uh it, shortly after this call we'll follow up with more details but you can expect to see communications toolkits and assets to help educate federal policymakers, including so draft, draft, so draft social media content, letters to the editor templates, talking points, and other resources. In addition, the James Beard Foundation will work to create opportunities and platforms for you to make your voices heard, including testimonial videos, social media campaigns, press engagements with reporters in your community and in your states that want to cover, cover this um, important topic. Uh, hosting events to bring together policymakers and chefs to make sure that they're hearing directly from you. Uh, we will engage directly with congressional members and their staff and executive executive branch officials, hopefully bringing some of you along with us into those conversations. And the James Beard Foundation leadership will also be in this fight directly with you and using their platforms to raise awareness throughout the course of this campaign. So that is all coming soon, but for now, we have some resources that I'd like to direct you to um, right now, on the James Beard website, we have a we have a landing page. Um, there, you can find uh, social media content that you can craft and shape into your own voice and deploy immediately. Uh, there's a two page fact sheet where we distilled this problem down to concise language, laying out the threats that climate change faces that poses to independent restaurants, the people you employ. Um, and some of the policy actions that we'd like to see from members of Congress that Trisha outlined earlier. Um, you can read the full report uh, that was discussed earlier. There's a press release that lays out the details of the campaign that's to come and more information that I think you'll find useful. But at the end of the day, this is just the beginning. We launched a couple of weeks ago and the campaign received a lot of attention, including in public publications that policymakers are reading on a daily basis. It generated more than 200 million earned media impressions. So they are seeing that this is coming. We've sent strong signals of what we intend to do and that we need to engage with them directly to solve this problem. But we need to build on this momentum. We need you alongside with us. We need your voices. They need to hear your voices. And so I hope that you'll, you'll join uh, this campaign and fill out the survey. It's, it's a brief survey, but that information is helpful. And then it'll give us the information we need to follow up with you to make sure that we engage you in the, in a way that makes sense for you. And so um, I look forward to working with you all. And that's my communication spiel. Over to Karen. Thank you so much, Mike. I think you have been able to really express just how impactful the work and people lifting up their own voice can be with talking about the reach that just one press conference went ahead and produced um, across the entire United States. When doing advocacy work, um, we need to make sure that we are repeating the message over and over again so we can break through to the public um, and in this specific case to key decision makers. Your work will be key to helping us do this. Over the next few months, we'll have opportunities to engage both in DC and at home in your communities, which Mike already lifted up. We are planning a congressional briefing, and besides the compelling data pulled together from the Global Food Institute report, your lived experience will be key to making a compelling case to Congress and to other key decision makers in the administration. Um, we may ask one or two of you to join us for that briefing, along with a local producer you partner with, um, because those are the stories that are going to have the biggest impact. Coming out of that briefing, we'll be organizing a chef-led letter to go to the Hill and to key administration decision makers, stressing the need for action and what policies that Trisha lifted up earlier can do to help mitigate climate change. We will also be organizing meetings up on Capitol Hill and with key decision makers within the administration. We'll be reaching out to you all to participate in some of these meetings once they're set up. And our timeframe for this is presently mid-May. 
Besides the local media and social media outreach you all are doing in your community, we encourage you to set up meetings or events with your local congressional and U.S. Senate office. Ideally, you'll meet with the elected official, but if not, we'll advise you who is best in the office to meet with. For example, a state director, a district director, or the staff person who handles the agricultural policy for that elected official. We are going to provide you with support to be prepared for these meetings. And, um, you know, besides the toolkits that Mike's already lifted up, there will be a how-to to do that, um, that in-district meeting with your elected official or their staff. Uh, the key for us getting the message to break through will be with consistent pressure and telling the real life story of climate change's impact on your business, your producers, and your communities. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Anne to share the first step of getting engaged in these upcoming efforts. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you to um, all of you who have contributed your voices to this uh, to today's briefing. Um, so as Karen, as Mike have said, um, Trisha, Bill, Tara, this is a national effort. Um, it goes much beyond JBF. It much it goes much beyond what we will do. Uh, and the, it goes. It is really about all of that that you will do. Um, we will be investing in the chefs who invest in this campaign um, because we know that your brand, your voice, and your time are very valuable, and we want to support you. Um, as you're fighting this fight alongside us. Um, and what is most important right now is to lift up your voice and your lived experience. So we have some homework for you. This is a webinar where you don't just get to listen to people talk, you get to do something afterwards. Um, Emily has put in the link to the survey and she's just put it in again uh, right now too. So, um, and she will share, I believe, um, her screen with the survey. Perfect. So this is a brief survey monkey survey. We ask you a number of questions on there, um, including your address. And why were we asking you for your address? Maybe like, why do you need to know that? This is so that we can always and easily look up who your representatives are um, so that we know exactly some of you might have a business in uh, Missouri, but live in Kansas or vice versa, for example. Um, so it's always good to know for us for us to have all of this information as we're developing tools and using existing tools to do some really good matchups uh, with representation. Uh, we're asking you about your social media handle so we can tag you. Um, business state here. And then after these very um, uh, quantitative questions, I think it's fair to say almost, we're asking you for um, some specific examples, and there's three or four questions here, um, to allow us, uh, as Mike mentioned, to develop talking points, to develop op-heads, to connect you to journalists, or if one of us is, ask, is answering questions from a journalist, we can say, Nina in California has been experiencing this, you should talk to her. Um, can you scroll back up? Sorry, Emily. Um, not up like so the the four questions are on around ingredient cost what are one or more ingredients you want to highlight that are specifically um gone up because of extreme weather events and can you provide specific details before and after increase or percentage of increase are there ingredients you no longer have access to because of climate change, either because they're not available or because they've become too expensive and you've just had to make some menu changes as a result? Um, and then question 16, have, how many days were you closed in the last uh, year based on, because of climate events? And then the question after that, uh, question 17, have you had to lay off staff because of pressures on business uh, as we keep hearing? Um, and then uh, question 18 is an open-ended question, if there's anything else you want to add. Um, so again, these are really important because they will allow us to point to specifics. Um, and if you're telling us, hey, I'm meeting with so-and-so, can you help me? We can immediately refer back to your answers as well. Um, it also means that when we are looking for uh, to do specific activities in specific states, we can look at the results of this survey and say, all right, there are a lot of chefs who responded from this area. This is clearly a place where we should be organizing an event. Or there's one chef in this area who has a, he's the only one who's responded. He has a critical representative member of the Senate Ag Committee. We absolutely must make sure they connect. We have that information. Um, we can uh, get a 
call from a journalist and we can say, oh, this chef in this state, she knows so much about her relationship with the farmer she's mentioning in her survey answers. Uh, this is exactly the kind of relationship and um, uh, impact that we can be spotlighting, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the questions that we ask you to answer. And then question 19, uh, what are you interested in doing with us or uh, on your own? Hosting a round table, going to DC, signing on to a chef letter to Congress, uh, share a video testimony, those kind of things. So there are multiple, multiple ways to get involved in this. Um, and then we have five more questions if any of you want to answer more of that. Um, so the those five ones, it's if you if there's more that you want to share. So we really, really invite you to answer this, um, to provide as many specifics when you are doing so. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, we will support you when you're doing that. We have resources to do this um, because this will all make the material that we prepare as effective as it can be. And it will also send media opportunities your way. Um, if you are serious about this work and you're ready to share data with us by, by answering this survey, we can provide resources such as stipends to support the work. If you're inviting your representative to dinner, for example, or if you need help getting to your state capital or getting to a, a local office. So um, we want to help you with this. We're not just asking you to do the work without support from JBF. Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, so please fill out this survey here. Uh, this is also a very long-term effort. This is, um, you know, we envision this as the beginning of a multi-year campaign. Um, there, so I'm saying this because you may have a certain amount of bandwidth now, you may have a certain amount of bandwidth in six months, you may have a certain amount of bandwidth next year, right? Um, that's also why we have this question on the ways in, want you, in which you wanna participate with us, because that can fluctuate based on, um, on what you are able to do now. You might be willing to do so much and only be able to do a little bit. We know how you all are. We see you at boot camp. You wanna tackle all of the issues all at once while also running businesses that are even more, ever more challenging, right? Um, do what you can. And if it's attending a webinar, that's great, right? We're not asking everybody on this call or everybody watching the recording or everybody who wants to get involved in the campaign to only do it if you can do it at 100%. We will support you and meet you where you are because this is a big movement of thousands and millions of people ultimately, and we are each making a little difference, right? So this is why there's so many ways to engage with us on this. All right. We are now going to take your questions in the chat, or if you want to raise your hand and come off mute, you can unspotlight me, Emily. I feel like I'm gigantic and yellow on everybody's screen. <laughs> we can all be on the same screen. So Linda is asking in the, in the chat, our current JBF award nominees, congrats, Linda, allowed to partner with a small scale producer to join the campaign 100%. Um, we didn't talk about that here, um, but obviously, um, you know, going, meeting with uh, your representatives alongside a small scale producer, alongside a farmer, um, a fisherman, a, uh, a rancher or someone else um, in your community. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, those are voices that that uh, representatives want to hear. Trisha, I'll let you add anything if there's anything else you want to say on this. I'll add and just say it's not just allowed, but encouraged in that telling the story and showing the interconnectedness between your business and the producers that support you is an important part of this story and how you're both affected. So I think it's a powerful way to, to show the impact of um, climate change on both sides. And forgive me, I wasn't dismissing that. I didn't, I was responding to the JB Award nominee piece. So yes, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't uh, agree more with Mike um, about going in with partners and allies that demonstrate your relationship to the broader food system. So absolutely. And the, the when you said partner and allies, that made me think too, um, this is a great opportunity to work with allies who might not always be your allies, right? I mean, this is, um, this is an opportunity to 
work with members of your communities that you may not be working with otherwise, because this is a problem for everyone that needs to be uh, solved by real movement action. Other questions? Testimonies, if any, I know some of you um, have done this work and have engaged with legislators around some of these climate change issues. Um, if you wanna share what you have found effective, you don't have to, I don't wanna be putting anyone on blast, but this is an opportunity for us to hear from you and from, for your uh, many colleagues on the call to hear from you as well. No questions, everyone just wants to get ready to work. Are you all filling out the survey already? Adrian is asking if there are efforts to work in underprivileged communities about these issues. Um, absolutely, and I think this is obviously also where um, you know best, all of you, who are the underprivileged communities in your areas. Um, and so this is a great opportunity to uh, let us know how we can support you in creating this community building around there and working with underserved uh, and underprivileged communities for sure. Uh, and obviously those are communities um, even geographically um, in terms of where they might be located in flood areas, for example, of particular cities who are affected um, more than um, most others. So, or at, or or at the forefront of a lot of that. Farm workers are a great example also of uh, underprivileged communities who are greatly affected. And then w William wants to go yell at congressmen. <laughs> we recommend perhaps a tactical approach, but <laughs> you do you, William. <laughs> And then blue, I'm not sure what are the nine states that are not represented, but uh, we will make sure um, to look that up. Uh, and then if the, if we know some of you in who, or near states, or um, if we have people who may have been to boot camp from these states, et cetera, we'll make sure um, to do outreach indeed, to get them to engage and to tell you how you can reach out to some of your friends and colleagues. And Blue is also asking if there's room for collaboration for those of us who are working on the native farm bill. Trisha, do you want to answer that one? Um, absolutely. Um, the, you know, we recognize that there have been incredible opportunities to build comprehensive policies and agendas um, that sit inside the farm bill and outside the farm bill. And a lot of the times there are better policies, more innovative policies that are targeted towards certain communities. And so um, there's no exclusive uh, <laughs> way in which we would, you know, um, identify policy that we want to, you know, lift up and advocate for. So 100%. Um, and what I want to be very clear about my presentation, that was a very high level you know, <laughs> um, because there are there have been a couple of recommendations of some specific marker bills that have been put out with some good friends from NSAC and others. And we we want it all. We want to be able to engage and push all, this entire agenda and learn about how people have already moved the, the needle on these issues that this community is we want to, you know, get up to speed on. So yes, yes, and yes. And then um, Adrian, if you're, uh, is asking, are you looking at resilient cities um, that are focusing and championing climate change? So you will see in the survey, there is a question where we ask you if your state or your city is doing something from a legislative perspective, uh, that would be a great model at the federal level um, to, to point that out. So uh, that's a that's a way to answer your question in that, you know, that what we're working on right now is at the federal level uh, for a question of, you know, engaging everyone um, at the same level to start with and then supporting you at the uh, at the local and state level. Um, so this is where for all of you, that's part of your homework, highlighting what are some good programs that are already in place where you are uh, that can help us create these models and then refer people to these models and saying, hey, here's what Austin is doing. Um, you're in uh, Portland. Uh, you should be looking at Austin or, you know, here's some legislation that uh, has been working out well there. 
Um, and then Linda is asking about global international effort and campaigns. So obviously it is a global challenge and there are um, you know, campaigns um, in every country and international efforts. Because this is a policy campaign, uh, it's focused on the US more specifically, but it doesn't mean that we're not working or that we wouldn't work or share best practices, ideas, et cetera, and engage in dialogue at the international level, obviously to make differences. Um, David is saying we don't have a lot of issues with extreme weather in, in southeastern Connecticut, knock on wood, indeed, <laughs> but climate change is dramatically affecting the local fishing industry with which we closely work. Is that an appropriate focus here for work in this program? Um, absolutely. And Tara and Bill, I'll throw it to you because there is a uh, seafood, there's a lot on fish and seafood in the report, if there's anything you want to add to that. Yes, I definitely think that this is something that we're going to continue to see challenges with um, over time, just due to the, the nature of these species really have extremely specific temperature ranges in which they can exist. And we see the lobster is the classic example of how their range has moved so far north and people who used to be lobster fishers in Connecticut no longer can do it because they can't capture enough in order to sustain their business. How can sustainable ingredient suppliers and producers get involved with this campaign? Asks Lizzie. Do they need to partner with a restaurant? Um, we were actually talking about that last week in our campaign planning. Um, the they do not need to partner with a restaurant because I think if they're if I mean first of all a sustainable ingredient supplier or producer most likely has a restaurant in their network um, who is involved in this work. So um, as um, Mike and Trisha were mentioning before, in answer to that, uh, that partnering is encouraged. So if there is a, an ingredient supplier who's not currently working with a restaurant in their local uh, area, this is where uh, we can pair you with people uh, because we will have everyone's zip code and address from filling out the survey. Um, and on the um, on the campaign web page, we have a form uh, for anyone who's interested in registering interest in participating in the campaign. So you have the survey that's more detailed, um, but we also have on the web page of the campaign a form that anyone who's interested uh, can fill out. Um, and uh, Nina was saying she'll be sharing this with her network. We encourage all of you to share news of this campaign with your network and point them to that page where they can register their interest. Mary's asking, can you speak to the ways chefs might branch out to more biodiverse foods and perhaps source more climate resilient crops that could be included on their menus? This could include traditional indigenous foods in the areas or in general plants that we know are more resilient to extreme weather patterns. Um, so we're, we're keeping the focus here today on uh, policy more specifically. Um, versus the sourcing of ingredients, uh, but that would definitely be part of the thing of the resources um, that we'll have later, and also of the networks that are created. I know on this call alone, um, chefs like Adrian uh, Lipscomb, Blue Adams, um, Allison Vick, uh, Jordan Rubin, I believe, are all Marisa Jankarli are all working already um, with um, to to have more biodiverse. Um, food sources and more climate resilient um, crops. And I'm sorry, I'm sure there's a lot more of you doing this. Um, Rob, Ruba, Kristen Dixon, I know that you're all doing on these kind of things. I'm just quickly scanning all the names on my screen here. So um, if any of you want to chime in on uh, in the chat and answer Mary there specifically, um, I know we have also Kimberly from Zero Footprint. They work very, uh, sorry, Tiffany from Zero Footprint. They work very closely on all of these issues. So um, we'll be working with a lot of partners on these things. And some of the some of the people who we'll be working with have these kind of uh, programs in place. Um, Andy's willing to get involved in any way they can using and they use exclusively small family farms. So great, very happy to hear this, even though um, it is because of 60% reduction in crop last year, which is unfortunately not an unheard story and uh, it's really dramatic. Thank you, William, for sharing 
articles here. And yes, of course, Mary, your point that if chefs are sourcing climate resilient crops, it might change how uh, it might change how policy, uh, which policies are passed in terms of what is subsidized, etc. Thank you, Mike, for sharing that you have been engaging with elected officials in DC many times. Um, and it is a great opportunity to find out how things work in DC. And I love that you put work in quote marks. <laughs> um, and for those of you who've been to boot camp, you always hear us say that. Um, your representatives, and in general, people like to hear from US chefs in general, period. Um, you have something interesting to say, you play really such a pivotal role in your communities. Um, and obviously when you're talking about issues, um, you know, the fact that you talk about it like no one else can is really, really crucial to this. More questions, anyone else from the campaign who wants to chime in on anything? Let's put the link, um, and I'm copying your link, William. Let's put the link to the climate webpage, to the campaign webpage, and to the survey one more time in the chat. Um, and Frank is saying, on the wine side of things, more East Coast producers are embracing hybrid varietals that are bred to be more resilient to climate change, another avenue for collaboration, absolutely. Um, one hundred percent that this is not just about food producers, uh, but a lot of the wine produce or not a lot wine producers in general in this country are also dealing with this very heavily Tara mentioned um, smoke in wine in California. Um, there's all these with the temperatures rising um, and more fires, etc. The changes of variety, we might have to change what varieties of grapes we're growing, where in the country, some regions that never produce wines will now start, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of change also on the beverage side of things um, and a lot of policy work there that also ties well together. All right, thank you, Tiffany, for putting your email in there. If anybody else wants to drop your email for anyone else to reach out to you, um, do so. And then otherwise, I want to thank Dr. Dietz, Dr. Scully, Trisha, Mike, Karen, uh, Emily, who's been uh, very aptly manipulating everything and who coordinates the camp, everything for the campaign. I um, want to thank you all for attending today. And um, very much look forward to engaging in this work with you. I look forward to seeing all of the survey responses coming in and then um, go with you to DC, come see you in your um, districts and uh, send you lots of resources so that you can do this work. Thank you so very much.